Okay, so good morning once again. So this is Power Technology and Arson Investigation. So as to the targets or objectives for this uh, session, at the end of the discussion, you should be able to understand, explain, and evaluate the chemistry of fire. And in this particular topic, we are going to discuss the elements of fire, the properties of fire, and the products of combustion and the stages of burning. So basically, the elements of fire includes the fuel, the oxygen, and the heat, which is represented by the fire triangle. So let us proceed with the first element of fire, which is fuel. When we talk about fuel, these are combustible materials which vaporizes and uh, can be burned. So for a fire to start, there must be something to burn. And fuel is a matter. And take note, matter exists in three physical states. We have there the solid, liquid, and gas. Now, solid melts to become liquids and this may be uh, vaporized and become gases no now uh, for the solid take note that in solids no uh, molecules are closely packed together for liquids the molecules are loosely packed and for gas the molecules are free to move To understand more about fuel as an element of fire, we have three categories or general categories of uh, fuel. So first is we have here the solid combustible materials. These are actually either organic or inorganic, natural or synthetic, and uh, metallic solid materials. So example of which includes the uh, coal, wood, a paper, a cloth, or even a grease. So uh, later on, on the succeeding slides, we will give more examples about this uh, solid, liquid, and gas. Now, uh, liquid, take note that liquid, this uh, particular co liquid combustible materials are flammable liquid fuels and chemicals. So this includes actually the gasoline, the kerosene, turpentine, uh, alcohol, a paint, a varnish, even a lacquer and the like. For the gas substances, these are actually toxic or hazardous gases which are capable of ignition. So what are the uh, examples of this? We have here the natural gas, we have here the propane, we have the butane or even a hydrogen and the like of course focusing on the uh, solid fuels it includes biomass fabrics and textiles including plastics coal or even peat so for the biomass these are actually replaceable organic matter as wood garbage and even animal manure that can be used to produce energy so, biomass materials other than wood are used as fuel. However, take note that uh, there are also factors which affects the combustibility of wood and the wood-based products. Uh, first is we have here the physical form as to the uh, thickness. Another is uh, we also have the moisture content or the water content. Of course, a uh, lesser moisture or lesser water will make a uh, wood be burned faster. Another factor is we have there the heat conductivity, including, of course, the rate and the period of heating, including the rate of combustion, and, of course, the ignition temperature. Next here is the uh, fabrics and the te textiles. So uh, basically, fibers and textiles are actually combustible. And when we talk about fiber, these are very fine, thin strand or a th thread-like object, which includes 
the natural fibers and the synthetic or the artificial fibers. Take note when we talk about natural fibers, these are from plants, uh, animals, or minerals. So example of this are the cotton, silk, wool, cashmere, hemp, or rami. Under the synthetic or artificial fibers, of course, these are organic fibers, which includes the uh, cellulose fibers or uh, cellulose uh, acetate fibers or non-cellulose fibers and inorganic fibers, which includes there the uh, polyester, acrylic, spandex, elastane, the rayon, and even nylon. So this fabric are twisted or woven fibers and textiles are machine woven or knitted fabrics. Now, uh, we also have here the uh, pros and cons of the synthetic fiber fabrics. So, uh, the for the pros, of course, under synthetic, these are inexpensive, wrinkle-free, moisture-wicking, low maintenance. And of course, on the cons, these are non-biodegradable. It is man-made. It is prone to heat damage and uh, it uses harsh chemicals. Now, on the uh, natural fiber fabrics, uh, the pros includes hypoallergenic, it is breathable, it is light or shedding, or light shedding, and it is biodegradable. Now, on the cons, of course, these are uh, uh, natural, so these are prone to shrinking, these are delicate, and holds uh, moisture, and these are expensive. So, uh, if you are going to take note, the, uh, uh, the synthetic fiber fabrics are more prone to heat damage than that of the natural fiber fabrics. Next here is we have there the plastics. These are uh, ordinary fuels under class A, except those materials composed of or um, containing cellulose nitrate. So, uh, when we talk about cellulose uh, nitrate, these are a chemical or powder which is used actually in uh, making bombs. And materials that use cellulose nitrate are also called pyroxylene. Now, we also have here the coal. It is used, of course, to heat buildings and uh, it can provide energy for industrial machineries. So, uh, it includes ignite or brown coal or the subbituminous coal. Uh, when we talk about bituminous coal, uh, these are uh, most plentiful. It is more carbon, more heat, of course, than that of the subbituminous uh, coal. And we also have the atracite, which is least uh, plentiful or and hardest, of course. Now, uh, we also have here the last, no? the uh, peat. These are uh, part partially decayed plant matter, which are actually found among swamps, called bugs, and used as fuel chiefly in areas where coal and oil are scarce. So, in Ireland and Scotland, for example, peat is cut, it is formed into blocks, and it is being dried. And uh, take note, these uh, dried blocks are then uh, burned in order to heat homes, of course. Next is we have here the liquid fuels. And under the liquid fuels, we have the uh, so-called flammable materials and the combustible materials. Now, uh, when we talk about flammable materials, these are materials which is considered flammable if it has a flash point of any temperature below 37.8 degree Celsius or 1000 degree Fahrenheit. On the other hand, when we talk about combustible materials, these are uh, materials which is of course considered combustible if it has a flash point higher than 
0.8 degree Celsius or 1000 degree Fahrenheit and below 93.3 degree Celsius. Now, take note that in the uh, flammable materials, the hazards include the production of vapors which actually burn or it is corrosive or uh, they are oxidizers, toxic, narcotic, and unstable. So we also have the so-called sloop over wherein the water is trapped at the uh, bottom of storage tanks and then it vaporizes from heat expanding and expelling contents above. Now take note that uh, technically, of course, flammable and combustible liquids do not cause actually fire. However, it is the vapors that they produce which burn or explode when exposed to air under the influence of heat. So technically, or basically, gasoline is the most widely, uh, widely used flammable liquid. Next is we have here the gas fuels. And under the gas fuels, we have different types based on source, based on physical properties, based on the usage, and based on chemical properties. First is based on the uh, source of the uh, gas fuel. We have here the natural and we have there the manufactured. So of course, uh, when we talk about the natural uh, gas fuels, these are commonly used to heat buildings. It is used to cook food and provide energy for industries. An example of this is the methane. It is actually a colorless and odorless gas, and it is usually mixed with compounds of the foul-smelling element sulfur, so gas leaks can be detected. Uh, we also have an example under natural, the butane and the propane gas which make up a small proportion of the natural gas become liquids when placed under the large amounts of pressure. Now, under the manufactured, example here is we have the coal, petroleum, and biomass, which can all be converted to gas through heating and by various chemical procedures. So, um... It can also be produced by treating such biomass as animal manure with bacteria called anaerobes. The bacteria expel actually the methane as they digest the waste. Now, another is another type of the gas fuels based on physical properties is uh, we have here the compressed, the liquefied, and the cryogenic. Under the compressed, in normal atmospheric temperature pressure inside its container, its pressure is, take note, dependent on how much gas is inside the container. Unlike in liquefied, in normal atmospheric pressure, partly in liquid state and partly in solid state, under pressure inside the container, and its pressure is actually dependent upon the temperature of the liquid. So uh, take note that in compress, it is dependent on how much gas is inside the container and liquefied is dependent upon the temperature of the liquid. On the other hand, cryogenic are liquefied gases which exist in its container at temperature far below the normal atmospheric temperature and usually slightly above its boiling point with low moderate pressure. Now, we also have here types of gas fuel based on the usage. We have the uh, fuel, industrial, and medical gas. Now, under, of course, the uh, fuel, it is used uh, for burning with air to produce heat and utilize as power or uh, it is used as light sources. Now, of course, in the industrial gas, it is used in the uh, industrial processes, such as the 
oxygen or acetylene, which are used in welding and cutting of metals. It also includes uh, the uh, freon, the ammonia, the sulfur dioxide, the hydrogen, the nitrogen, the chlorine, and the fluorine, which is, uh, or uh, it also includes the uh, gas which are used for refrigeration or chemical processing or even water treatment. Now, uh, we also have the medical gas. So, of course, uh, in the medical gas, it is used for treatment such as anesthesia and for uh, respiratory therapy such as the chloroform, the nitrous oxide, and even oxygen. And the last among the gas fuels is the types of gas fuels based on chemical properties. So we have, of course, the uh, flammable gases and the non-flammable. Of course, uh, these are any gases. When we talk about flammable gases, uh, these are any gases which burn in normal concentration of oxygen in the air. So it includes the uh, natural gas, which is the most uh, common flammable gas. We also have methane. Uh, uh, for methane, these are lighter than air and it is not actually toxic. We also have propane and the butane, which are actually colorless, tasteless, or even odorless and not toxic. However, it is heavier than air. We also have acetylene under the flammable gases, which are actually colorless, tasteless, odorless, and shock sensitive. Another example is we have their hydrogen. We also have the ethylene oxide, and we also have oxidizer. Oxidizer can actually burn inside its own container. Now, we also have the so-called the non-flammable, in which it includes gases that which does not burn in air, or those that do not support combustion, is uh, called the uh, inert gases. Now, example of which is uh, the oxygen, which is the very most common non-flammable gases. It does not actually burn. And uh, under the non-flammable, it also includes or it includes also the ammonia, refrigerants, even halogens, even ha acid gases. And we also have there the inert gases and other gases. Another is... Uh, we have here the reactive gases. So when we talk about reactive gases, these are any gases that will react within itself. And we also have the toxic gases. These are any gases that may complicate firefighting efforts due to its serious life hazards. To continue under the fuel, we have also other types which includes the chemical fuels and the nuclear fuels. So uh, when we talk about chemical fuels, these are produced in solid and liquid form which create great amounts of heat and power. So basically, these uh, chemical fuels are uh, used in rocket engines and these are used in uh, some racing cars and uh, last is we have there the nuclear uh, fuels so under the nuclear fuels it provides energy through the fission or fusion of their atoms so when we talk about nuclear fission there is a split of the nucleus of atoms and when we talk about the nuclear fusion of course, the combination of the two light nuclei, nuclei of atom. Now, uh, take note that in the nuclear fuels, uranium is the most common. However, the plutonium uh, also provides nuclear energy. So, when these atoms, when the atoms, I mean, of these elements undergo fission, they release tremendous amounts of heat 
and nuclear fuels are used mainly to generate electricity. So, they also power some submarines and even ships. And nuclear energy can also be produced through the fusion of hydrogen atoms. So, our second element of fire is we have here the heat. Um, as we have stated, for a fire to start, there must be a source of ignition. And uh, this source of ignition could be either in the form of uh, usually actually heat or a spark. And these heat sources include open flame, hot surfaces, sparks and arcs, friction chemical action, electrical energy, and compression of gases. So basically, when we talk about heat, it is uh, an energy in transit. In other words, it always flows from a substance at a higher temperature to the substance at a lower temperature, raising the temperature of the latter and lowering than that of the former substance, providing the volume of the bodies remains constant. And heat does not flow from a lower to a higher temperature unless another form of energy transfer work is also present. To betterly understand the characteristics of a heat, we have here the so-called the latent heat and we also have there the specific heat and we have there the uh, transfer of heat. These three will be furtherly discussed in the succeeding slides. So uh, basically when we talk about latent heat, these are energy absorbed or released by a substance during a change in its physical state or phase that occurs without changing its temperature. Take note, the key word here is that it occurs without changing its temperature. Now, in a specific heat, the amount of heat to be supplied to the unit mass of a system in order to increase its temperature by 1 degree. Take note, in a specific heat, there must be, uh, uh, what do you call this, an increase or decrease in its temperature by 1 degree. And we have here the transfer of heat. It describes the flow of heat or known as the thermal energy due to temperature differences and the subsequent temperature distribution and changes. Try to observe the figure that I am uh, showing in the uh, PowerPoint presentation. If the solid turns into liquid and into gas, the temperature remains constant as solid turns to liquid, and at the same time, the temperature remains constant as liquid turns into gas. So, uh, between the solid and the liquid, there is a latent heat of fusion. And between the liquid and the gas, there is a latent heat of vaporization. However, take note that uh, the temperature remains constant as solid turns into liquid and as it turns into gas. So, basically, for example, when a pot of water is kept boiling, the temperature remains at 100 degrees Celsius until the last drop evaporates because all the heat being added to the liquid is absorbed as latent heat of vaporization and carried away by the escaping vapor molecules. Another example under the latent heat is in the form of an ice, wherein the, when the uh, heat energy is taken from the environment, there is melting, wherein it uh, changes from so solid to liquid, and there is evaporation which turns liquid into a vapor and that is what you call sublimation the changing of solid into gas and on the other hand when the vapor 
is uh, turned or changes into liquid, that is what you call condensation. And if that liquid will be uh, turned into ice, there is freezing. And that particular changing of vapor into ice is what you call deposition. So the heat energy is also released to the environment. So if the pressure is constant, these processes occur at constant temperature. So from ice, it vaporizes, and then it will return to become an ice. And uh, the temperature is still constant, and that is what you call the latent heat. Another is we have here the specific heat. The heat capacity or the measure of the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a unit mass of a substance 1 degree. So if the heating process occurs while the substance is maintained at a constant volume or is subjected to a constant pressure, the measure. So generally, the two specific heat of a substance depend on the temperature. Just like on the uh, figure that is uh, presented in the PowerPoint. Uh, the same are in uh, the same are having uh, 100 degree Celsius temperature. However, the uh, specific heat for a metal spoon is different to the specific heat capacity of a wooden spoon. So, uh, in, in the daily, in our daily life, we experience that if a metal spoon is uh, placed in a boiling water, when we touch, it is very hot or it's too hot. On the other hand, when we submerge also a wooden spoon, it is warm as compared to the metal spoon. So, uh, basically... The uh, different materials have their specific heat capacity. So, as I was saying a while ago, different materials have different uh, specific heat capacity. The uh, heat capacity of water is not the same as to the gasoline, as to the rubber, as to the plastic, as to the asbestos, as to the asphalt cement, charcoal, steel, copper, silver, and gold. So these uh, materials have different specific heat capacity. So the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of 1 kilogram of a substance by 1 degree Celsius. So uh, if you are going to compare between a 1 kilogram water with the same amount of temperature the water will reach its uh, specific heat capacity within uh, a specific time as compared also with the uh, one, kilogram, 1 kilogram gold. So there is also a specific, a specific heat capacity for gold. So moving on. We will now proceed with the transfer of heat. So when we talk about transfer of heat, it pertains to the science dealing with the transfer of heat between bodies. So uh, we have there the so-called conduction, which requires physical contact between the bodies or portions of bodies exchanging heat, or energy is transferred by direct contact. In convection, Energy is transferred by the mass motion of molecules. So, uh, it occurs when a liquid or gas is in contact with a solid body at a different temperature and is always accompanied by the motion of the liquid or gas. And we also have here the radiation, wherein it does not require contact or the presence of any matter between the bodies. It's only through elect electromagnetic wave. So if you are going to observe on the figure, energy is transferred by the electromagnetic radiation. 
meaning the heat is transferred even if there is no di direct contact or there is no uh, mass motion of molecules. Another is we have here another example under the transfer of heat. So basically the sun hits the ground and that is what you call radiation. And if the ground hits the air, that is what you call conduction. And if the warm air rises, there is convection. Another uh, illustration on the transfer of heat. So in this particular example, the radiation uh, actually emanates from the fire that is being produced. So the energy that is radiated or transmitted in the form of rays or waves or particles. And the, uh, uh, there is conduction if there is already transfer of heat or electric current from one substance to another by direct contact. And uh, there is already convection if the transfer of heat is through a fluid uh, or liquid uh, or gas caused by molecular motion. So uh, in this particular uh, example, the firewood which is uh, burning will transfer radiation to the cookware and that cookware will uh, be conducted and the uh, things that are being cooked in that cookware will result to convection. And last under the transfer of heat is the direct flame contact. This is actually the most hazardous structure ignition mechanism because uh, from the word itself, the flame has a direct contact to a particular substance. So heat may be conducted from one body to another by direct flame contact. So the fire spreads along or thorough uh, burning by flame contact. So there is a thorough burning if there is a direct flame contact. So moving on, and this is our last element of fire, which is the oxygen. So oxygen in air is the common oxidizing agent to combine with fuel vapor. And uh, in the components of air, we have there uh, nitrogen with 78%, oxygen, with 20.9%. In some other uh, sources, it is uh, rounded off at 21%. And 1% uh, inert gases or other gases, which may include argon or the carbon dioxide. Now take note that 12% of the oxygen is insufficient to produce fire. However, at 14 to 15% oxygen, it can support flash point and at 16% to 21% it can support fire point. Okay, so I hope you are still there listening to my lecture. Now let us proceed with the properties of fire. So in this particular slide, we will focus on the physical properties of fire. So uh, we have here the specific gravity which involves the ratio of the weight of a solid or liquid substance to the weight of an equal volume of water. On the other hand, we have here the uh, vapor density, the weight of a volume of pure gas composed to the volume of dry air at the same temperature and pressure. And likewise, we have there the vapor pressure, the force exerted by the molecules on the surface of a liquid. And temperature uh, actually measures the degree of thermal agitation of molecules. And we have here the boiling point, of course, the constant temperature at which the vapor pressure of a liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. Next is we have there the uh, ignition or kindling temperature, the minimum temperature at which the substance must be heated in order to initiate combustion. 
And once again, we have here the fire point, the lowest temperature of a liquid in an open container at which vapors are evolved fast enough to support combustion. And last, we have here the flash point. The temperature at which a flammable liquid forms a vapor air mixture that ignites. So this mixture, uh, mixture is uh, mixed with, within the explosive range. So to burn a fuel or a combustible material, its temperature must be raised until ignition point is reached. Thus, before a fuel is start to burn or before it can be ignited, it has to be exposed to a certain degree of temperature. And when the temperature of a certain substance is very high, it releases a highly combustible vapors, which are known as the uh, free radicals or the combustible vapors such as hydrogen gas, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and the nitrogen so uh, during the process as you can see on the figure the process of pyrolysis it involves the fuel that is being heated until its temperature reaches its fire point and there is a decomposition that takes place wherein moisture in the fuel is converted to vapor and this decomposition produces combustible vapors that rise to the surface of the fuel, which is the free radicals. And the free radicals undergo combustion. So uh, we have here the, uh, the uh, figure for this uh, particular uh, pyrolysis. Now let us proceed with the chemical properties of fire. So endothermic reaction changes whereby energy or the heat is absorbed or added before the reaction takes place. On the other hand, exothermic reaction, those that release or give off energy or heat, thus they produce substances with less energy than the reactants. So if you are going to observe endothermic uh, requires endothermic reaction which is cooler than the surroundings. And in exothermic, the exothermic reaction is hotter than the surroundings. So uh, the energy is conserved in chemical reactions. And the total energy of the system is the same before and after a reaction. Another chemical property of fire is the oxidation or a chemical change that is exothermic. A change in which combustible material or the fuel and the uh, oxidizing agent or the air reacts. So uh, when we talk about oxyg oxidation, these are the chemical reaction with oxygen combining with a substance to form new substances. So example of this oxidation is the combustion, which is the same as actual burning or there is a rapid oxidation as you can see on the figure. And another chemical properties of fire is we have here the flames. Basically flames are incandescent or uh, very bright, glowing with intense heat gases. So it is a combustion product and a manifestation of fire when in its gas phase combustion. So uh, from the figure being flashed on the PowerPoint, as you can see, there are different uh, forms or there are different uh, types of flames, as you can see. As you can see also, we have here different uh, figures, different uh, size, even uh, on the uh, color of the flame, there are differences. Even on the uh, characteristics of the smoke produced by the flames, there are differences. So what are these differences that I am referring to? Uh, flame in terms of the uh, color and the completeness of combustibility of fuel, we have there the so-called luminous flame and the non-luminous flame. 
So luminous flame is orange red deposit suit at the bottom of a vessel being heated due to the incomplete combustion and has a low temperature. As compared to the non-luminous flame, it is blue or there is a complete combustion of fuel and has relatively high temperature. So another distinction between the two is that in lumino luminous flame, uh, it could either be orange to red, so bright yellow in color, it produces a lot of light, large and unsteady, it produces soot, it has four zones, it burns quietly and moderately it is hot. In non-luminous, uh, as, we, as we stated a while ago, it is uh, blue in color, it produces less light, it is small and steady, and it does not produce soot, and it has three zones, and it burns noisily. And uh, take note, non-luminous flame is very hot as compared to the luminous flame. Another uh, characteristics or type of flame is uh, based on the fuel and air mi mixture. So we have here the so-called the premix and we have there the so-called diffusion. So in premix, it is exemplified by a Bunsen type laboratory burner where hydrocarbon is thoroughly mixed with air before reaching the flame zone. So in premix, the heat release occurs much, much faster and there is an increased flame propagation and there is no definite theories to predict behavior. Unlike in diffusion, it is observed when gas or the fuel alone is forced through a nozzle into the atmosphere which diffuses in the surrounding atmosphere in order to, flow, to form a flammable mixture. So, uh, one common example under the diffusion flame is the flame produced by the candle. So, it is governed purely by molecular diffusion and the flame of the uh, oxyethylene torch wherein there is a diffuse or dispersed or widely spread flame. So, uh, in diffusion, it can obtain high rates of combustion energy release per, per unit volume. And another example is the uh, diesel engine, wherein uh, modeling is very complex. There is no well-established approach in diffusion. Another is, uh, we have here the uh, types of flame based on smoothness. So, if the particle follows a smooth path through a gaseous flame, it is laminar. And those having unsteady, irregular flows as uh, physical size, gas density, or velocity is increased, uh, that is what you call uh, turbulent. So, all laminar gas flows tend to become turbulent. So, uh, moving on with our discussion, let us now proceed with the products of combustion. So, basically, first we have here the fire gases, the uh, chemical composition of the fuel, percent of oxygen present, and the temperature of fire. And we have here the uh, flame, which is the luminous body of a burning gas. So, it is the manifestation of the fire when the fire is in its gas phase combustion. And of course, a heat is produced wherein a form of energy is generated by the transmission of some other form of energy. And of course, last is we have there the smoke, a visible product of incomplete combustion. So there is a mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and finally divided particles which are released from the burning material. So another illustration under the product of combustion, of course, once again, we have there the uh, gas, the flame, the heat, and of course, we have there the smoke. So uh, take note that uh, there is no combustion if one of this uh, product is not produced. Wow, we are now on our last topic of this uh, discussion. The stages of 
burning. So as you can see, these are the uh, stages. So we have there the incipient stage, and then there is a growth of the uh, uh, fire or burning, and then until it will be fully developed, until it will begin to decay. Another uh, illustration on the stages of burning, as you can see on the uh, illustration or the uh, picture, we have there the incipient phase or uh, the beginning stage of fire. Where in, uh, in that particular example, there is still normal uh, room temperature and then followed by the uh, growth and uh, growth of the uh, fire or burning which involves the uh, free burning phase uh, wherein burning stage whereby materials or structures are burning in the presence of adequate oxygen supply so if you can observe the fire has involved more fuel and the oxygen supply is depleted and last is the smoldering phase or uh, there is a full development of the uh, burning process and the burning stage where in flame ceases but dense smoke and heat completely fill the confined room. Another example can be uh, seen in this uh, particular picture or illustration among the uh, matches. So we have there the uh, uh, incipient phase and then there is a growing of uh, uh, growth of uh, the burning process or growth of fire and then we have there the uh, free burning phase and we have there the smoldering phase so take note that in the incipient or in the beginning phase uh, there is still the uh, normal room temperature wherein there is an oxygen which is plentiful there is a thermal updraft rise which accumulates at higher point and the flame temperature could either be 1000 degree Fahrenheit or uh, the temperature at the base of the fire is 400 to 800 degree Fahrenheit. As to the uh, ceiling temperature, it is about 2000 Fahrenheit degree Fahrenheit and it produces a uh, pyrolysis product such as carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, water vapor and other uh, gases. Now, uh, in the incipient or beginning phase, the temperature has not built up to high peak, thermal up, uh, updraft rises and accumulates at highest point, and the uh, breathing in this phase is not yet difficult. And in terms of the fire extinguishment, you can just uh, directly apply water at the base of the fire. And in terms of ventilation, it is not actually a problem. And uh, there is a little steam production. Now, as you can see on the free burning phase or the second phase or second stage of burning, the, uh, the materials or structures are burning in the presence of adequate oxygen or supply. If you are going to observe on the uh, illustration, the fire is already... Uh, on the higher level so fire has involved more fuel the oxygen supply is depleted the heat accumulates at the upper area and uh, the temperature is about 800 to 1000 degree fahrenheit at the base of fire and uh, on the ceiling it has about uh, 1200 to 1600 degree fahrenheit so there is already accelerated pyrolytic processes which are taking place during the free burning phase and the development of the convection current formation of thermal column as heat rises. So the pyrolytic decomposition moves upward on the walls or uh, crawling of the flame. There is a crawling of the flame leaving burnt pattern or uh, what you call the fire fingerprints and uh, in this stage there is already an occurrence of the flashover and the area is fully involved so uh, if you are going to observe the heat is accumulated at the upper areas now in terms of the breathing difficulty among casualties of course, mass is uh, recommended. 
and in the extinguishment of this uh, stage of fire or stage of the uh, stage phase, the area of the major involvement should be extinguished. Now, in the ventilation, it uh, not a definite needs actually, and good steam production is required. Now, let us proceed with the last stage of uh, burning, which is the smoldering phase, wherein the uh, flame ceases. However, dense smoke and heat is uh, completely filling the confined room. Now, in this uh, particular phase, the oxygen will drop to 13% uh, or below, causing the flame to vanish and the heat to develop in layers. So, flames may actually die and leave only glowing embers or superheated fuel under pressure with little oxygen. Now, intense heat will vaporize lighter fuel components such as hydrogen, methane, uh, which actually increases the hazard. So, um, the products of incomplete combustion increases, particularly carbon monoxide. Now, uh, temperature throughout the building is very high and normal breathing is not possible. And the uh, oxygen deficiency may cause backdraft. So, uh, in terms of the fire extinguishment, it can be applied through the uh, indirect method. And uh, in terms of ventilation, there is a mass or uh, there is a need for uh, enough ventilation and uh, maximum steam production from the water fog is necessary. So take note that the er earlier the fire is detected, the easier, the easier is to be extinguished. So the moment that you have detected at the incipient stage or stage one, the easier that it can be, uh, that the fire can be extinguished. Take note in the incipient, this is the uh, initial stage, only air ionization and there is no smoke. In the smoke stage and the flame stage, the smoke is visible from the point of ignition and flame can be seen with the naked eye. And uh, we have there the heat stage, fire is considerably higher. Okay, so that's it uh, to summarize the things that we have uh, discussed. Uh, we have uh, identified the different elements of fire and uh, we have uh, identified the different properties of fire including the products of combustion and uh, we have uh, discussed the different stages of burning. Okay, so thank you once again for listening for this uh, video lecture on the chemistry of fire. So thank you and God bless.